Follicular lymphoma is one of the many different subtypes of non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. It's sometimes a challenge when meeting a new patient especially and we talk about the diagnosis of non-Hodgkin's lymphoma and we mention that there's not just one subtype, that there's many different subtypes, in fact over 50 different subtypes. The important aspect we tell them though, they're all treatable, but how we approach them are a little bit different. So where follicular lymphoma falls into the mix of the many different subtypes, it's actually the second most common overall in the United States in general, behind only diffuse large B-cell lymphoma. Follicular lymphoma accounts for about 15%, uh, maybe a little bit more in some series in terms of what percent of all non-Hodgkin's lymphomas. In general, there are 70,000 cases of non-Hodgkin's diagnosed each year in the U.S. And so you can do the math in terms of 15 to 20 percent of those being follicular lymphoma. In terms of diagnosis of follicular lymphoma, we'll always recommend a couple things. One is a biopsy. We really can't make a guess, not just of lymphoma on a CAT scan or a blood test, etc., but moreover the exact subtype. And that's where the biopsy becomes important, number one, and number two, a really good expert pathologic review because it can be tricky sometimes. Sometimes we'll see in a large lymph node, it'll be suspicious for lymphoma, we'll do a biopsy, and we'll see follicular lymphoma in one piece of the lymph node and in another area, sometimes even see a different type of lymphoma. And as you can imagine, you want all the information possible before you start. There are a lot of different treatment options for follicular lymphoma. I think the one key tenet, I, I would say, for follicular lymphoma, it is definitely not one size fits all. And so part of that is certainly individualized to the patient situation, but also to some biases of, of the practice of, of the physician. I would say most important is the patient, and meaning, in other words, do they have what we would call low tumor burden, low lymphoma burden, or high lymphoma burden. And when we say low lymphoma burden, that means really low, meaning they're completely asymptomatic, and everything's very small, their blood counts look great, they're living their normal life. That's one subset. The second subset is basically anything positive or anything abnormal, whether it's a low blood count, whether they're having fatigue or sweats, whether they have, sometimes they might be asymptomatic, but have a really big lymph node. Any kind of red flags like that would fall into the higher lymphoma burden. And I think most people would agree then, okay, the second group needs treatment. That first group, the low tumor burden, there's some debate. Do you need to rush to treatment? In other words, can you do watchful waiting? I would, I would say that's still a very valid option. I recommend it to patients. In other words, it's hard sometimes when someone says, oh, I have lymphoma, I have cancer, and wait, you're not gonna treat? But what we tell them is, yeah, yes, there are treatment options, but delaying treatment does not affect your prognosis. At least there's no data that shows that, um, number one. And number two, even though treatments nowadays have low toxicity, there's no treatment that is toxicity free. So it's hard sometimes to reconcile, to take someone who's asymptomatic, feels great, and to treat if we know we can hold that treatment till later. But I wouldn't say it's wrong to treat. I would say if someone is gonna treat low tumor burden, I would advocate maybe softer treatment like a single agent antibody such as rituximab. That's low lymphoma, so what about high lymphoma burden? I think there's some debate there. Uh, I would say there are different options. Again, not one size fits all. I would say the most common option would be combining monoclonal antibody rituximab with chemotherapy. It's probably the most common. Now, which chemotherapy? Not a definite answer. The most common nowadays is one called bendamustine. It's all outpatient, you give it a couple days in a row, every four weeks for six cycles. Then a patient goes in remission. There are other chemotherapy options it is, is one aspect. And that's what we call, by the way, the, when we talk about the higher lymphoma burden, the first part of that treatment, we call it induction. In other words, induce remission. So that's, that's that common. Now, could you use rituximab by itself? You could, you don't get as high of a remission rate, but it wouldn't be a wrong choice. What's really exciting are some studies looking at non-chemotherapy options. An ongoing randomized study, randomizing patients to standard rituximab chemotherapy, patients with lymphoma burden, higher lymphoma burden, to rituximab and lenalidomide, which is an oral agent.
And so could we be in a point a few years down the road, maybe sooner, where we're not even using chemotherapy for higher tumor burden? In other words, just using novel therapeutics, including, including some oral medications. The second part of treatment phase for newly diagnosed higher tumor burden follicular lymphoma after induction is what we call maintenance. And what do we get for maintenance? The standard, it's FDA approved, is two years of rituximab every couple of months. Now, is that should all patients receive maintenance therapy? I wouldn't say all. I would say it's a common treatment. I usually recommend it as long as the patient has not had any infections or has hepatitis, things like that. Uh, but we're looking, can we make that better? Can we add oral agents uh, to that? We just finished a large randomized study with an ECOG where we actually added the lenalidomide to the maintenance, to the rituximab. So trying to look at it from different patient groups and different phases of treatment. In terms of the studies, looking at lenalidomide or adding other novel agents, that's not the only one. There are some other ones being added. Uh, in our ECOG study, we actually added bortezomib to bendamustine and rituximab. I would still say the jury's out in terms of that data. So the exciting part is those studies have been done to try to basically move the bar or move the bar higher, get us forward. In other words, we know with standard rituximab bendamustine, about 90% of patients go into remission, and on average it lasts for about three to four years. So that's good, but we want it longer. We want it to be 100% remission with minimal toxicity and for it to be more, many more years longer. But we want to have our cake and eat it too. We want to add treatment, but not add toxicity. So that's where the use of novel agents comes into play. And, and so there are a bunch of studies starting to look at that in follicular lymphoma. And so I would hope in the next years and maybe even the next several months that we'll start to see some of this information. But we can't assume it'll be good. We always have to test it and make sure, but it is very hopeful. Treatment for relapsed refractory follicular lymphoma, thankfully there are a lot of treatment options. I would say it's somewhat similar to paradigms of newly diagnosed in that we initially look at, okay, do we need to treat? Because there are some patients who there'll be a slight lymph node growth on a CAT scan after receiving therapy, but if they feel great, you don't need to rush to treatment. You follow them. Now, if there's kind of precipitous, significant growth or symptoms, yes, you need treatment. So that's always, I like to step back and say, all right, do you need treatment? In other words, we don't treat a CAT scan. We, of course, want to treat the patient. So if a patient does need treatment, sometimes you can repeat the initial treatment. If it's been a long time, they've been in remission. Can you use antibody by itself? Sure. Uh, what are other options besides antibody, besides chemotherapy? There's something still out there called radioimmunotherapy, where it's a one-time dose of radio-labeled CD20 antibody, still active. Uh, that's a good treatment. But the real exciting part are these novel therapeutic agents. There's a medication called idelalisib that's now approved for patients with relapse refractory indolent lymphoma. And, and there are others being explored. And so I think we're really excited about just the multitude of new novel agents being excited. That's one piece, but what I had alluded to before, that kind of individualization, this whole era where we talk about personalized treatment. You know, so it's one where, okay, great, we have these new treatments, but nothing, unfortunately, is 100%. And so let's say it works 30% or 40% or even 50 or 60. So that's good, but that means there's a percentage where it's not working. How can we identify those patients up front in the treatments that work? And that's what's called through biomarkers or correlative studies. So a lot of these clinical trials that I had alluded to have those embedded. In other words, not just does it work, can we figure out a priori ahead of time who it works best in? In other words, really personalize the therapy. In terms of minimal residual disease, so that goes to part of the personalization. In other words, does that tell us after we finish a certain treatment, instead of a CAT scan, which is kind of gross disease, so to speak, can we look at minimal residual, meaning like really special tests? There's a test called FISH, fluorescent in situ hybridization, or PCR, can we do these looking at really rare cells? So one is, yes, we can do that, but what we're actually still in the phase of, of okay, we detect it, does it, is it helpful to give a treatment? Because sometimes you find something, it doesn't, it does it, is it important to really give a treatment? In other words, is it really predictive? So those are being tested too.
does the presence of really rare cells after you finish your first treatment matter in terms of what whether you should be treated and number one number two what treatment you should get so that goes to all the personalized therapy that's very important so in terms of clinical trials I think in follicular lymphoma and frankly lymphomas in general or probably cancer in general it's a very exciting time and and I view it as there gives the patient more options number one and number two it gives you access more often than not, to really new cutting edge therapy. And diagnostics are often, uh, as I mentioned, part of these studies. And so I wouldn't say it's right or wrong to go on a study, but I would say it's an option. And most of the studies nowadays in lymphoma, including follicular lymphoma, we're not trying to find more new chemotherapies. We're trying to find more effective, targeted, non-toxic therapies. And so usually in follicular lymphoma, it is trying to replace the standard or maybe even make the standard better or make the standard better or less and less toxic. If, if it is an exciting time in terms of clinical trials and all the different new agents, there are literally in laboratories thousands being tested and in studies in lymphoma probably almost a hundred now being studied. So that's fantastic. The challenge with that is that's a lot of information, that's a lot of data. It's a lot of data for the provider to handle, much less the patient, and so how does a patient navigate this? And uh, those couple patients I mentioned I saw, they both were on the internet, uh, online, and they said they were overwhelmed. Uh, different sites they went to, and I wrote three letters down for them to go to LRF. And I said, it's just the facts. And sometimes you need just the facts, uh, uh, one part. And I think a second part I said is there's unbelievable patient support. In other words, people who've been there, done that. And to give that not just a knowledge on helping navigate, but just kind of psychologic support, emotional support sometimes. I always recommend the LRF to patients because it is a wealth of information it's extremely organized and it helps put things in place.